uh, welcome back, everybody, and thank you for joining us uh, for um, today's uh, King's College London um, OCR Class Civ uh, Greek Theatre Component Day. Our second uh, lecture is on uh, violence uh, in Oedipus Tyrannus, the Bacchae and Frogs, and uh, is delivered by Professor Edith Hall, uh, who we're very lucky to have as a colleague with us at King's. Uh, Edith needs uh, little introduction, both because she is one of Britain's most famous classicists, um, but also because of uh, the, the epic work she's been doing over uh, the, the last few years, um, promoting uh, classive and ancient history in particular, and working with schools. So I know many of you will already have come across her um, in that regard. So I'm very grateful for uh, Edith taking time out of a ludicrously busy schedule to, um, to speak to us and uh, I will pass over uh, to Edith now. So Edith, if you, you have about sort of 45 minutes-ish uh, and then we'll, we'll, we'll take uh, questions afterwards. So the floor is yours. Thank you so much. It's lovely to be with you all and um, three of my favourite plays are three plays on the uh, A-level Classical Civilization Greek Theatre module. I uh, thought of various different ways I could link them. And I thought violence was uh, quite a good one um, because all of Greek theatre involves some kind of engagement with violence. And we may all be feeling after being stuck in our houses for a whole year, rather full of adrenaline with nowhere to put it. So let's at least have an emotional outlet for it today. So the two big things that connect these three plays. I think the thinking behind the people at OCR who selected them, uh, th th there's two real things. One is Thebes, which is the setting of both the Greek tragedies. And the other is Dionysus, which is the setting, uh, who is the protagonist of Bacchae and Frogs. So there's very clear um, sort of reason that puts them together. Also Bacchae, and frogs are both put on in the same year in 405 BCE. We don't know the date for Oedipus Tyrannus and don't believe anyone who tries to tell you that we know the date. Uh, there's a guess that it was put on uh, shortly after the great plague of Athens because it starts with a plague to which my response is always, well, so does the Iliad and we don't date that to shortly after the great plague of Athens. So we don't know the date of the Oedipus Tyrannus, but we do know that it's um, one of the darkest plays about Thebes, and it's one in which Mount Kithiron, uh, I'm going to talk about quite a lot. So it's important just to remember where Thebes is. It's actually incredibly near Athens. It's only 24 hours uh, walk, walk from Athens over those Kithiron mountains. It has been dug up, it was excavated at the end of the 19th century, and it was a magnificent Bronze Age community with um, Linear B, uh, literacy, and a very uh, rich um, standard of living in terms of oil and wine finds, those kinds of things. So it's a really eminent ancient city and um, had been in the Bronze Age when these plays are set, far more important than Athens was. This is a picture of what it looked like in the 19th century, the ruins of it. Uh, you have to imagine the great wall around it with, with the seven gates. And you can see it's in this sort of flat Boeotian plain. It's far from the sea, and that's really important. It always has this very, um, most Greek city-states like Corinth and uh, Athens, uh, are very close to the sea and they're maritime. Thebes is peculiarly sort of inland and that adds to that sense of uh, claustrophobia that we tend to get in the Theban plays. A sort of hot uh, society rather turned in on itself where plague strikes and, and the kings are incestuous. But you can see in that drawing how imposing Kithiron is over the top of it and why it sort of dominates the consciousness. And of course, it's where some of the most important events lying in the background of Oedipus and Bacchae both take place. And I've shown you another map there 
to show you. There's Athens and Attica. These are the mountains between Kithiron and Parnassus, Parnes, where you had to walk over to get to Thebes on the other side. But Thebes was also deadly enemy of Athens. Um, it had uh, colluded with the Persians in the Persian Wars, uh, which made it deeply unpopular for 50 years afterwards. I always think it's a bit as if, say, Birmingham had invited Hitler in with a helicopter pad. How would we still think about Birmingham, you know, uh, 70 years later? Um, and that's a rather nice reconstruction of what the actual temple, uh, the temple centre, the civic centre of Thebes must have looked like. That is where we, we, we are to imagine, for example, the opening of the Oedipus um, when we hear that the, some of the suppliants are sitting in the market square near the temple. So what is the actual violence in Oedipus? Well, with all three plays, I've divided it into what we actually see and what we hear about. And if you were to write about violence in any of these plays or you were to get any of these passages, it's very important to make that distinction. With Greek tragedy, of course, famously, the actual really violent action of the play, uh, with the exception of only two tragedies, right? We've got, we've got about um, 19, uh, 17, 18 plus 14. We've got about, you know, 30 Greek tragedies. And there's only two in which there is real on stage violence. And that's Sophocles Ajax and Euripides Suppliant Women. Uh, there's a bit at the end of Aeschylus's Agamemnon, but it's arrested before anybody kills anybody. So what have we got on stage? Well, not that much, but what there is, is incredibly graphic. Firstly, the two scenes, the two episodes where Oedipus has really bad arguments with Tiresias and Creon, we get the sense of how Oedipus has become very paranoid and very precipitous, hasty in his judgment. It's not exactly scripted. There aren't internal stage directions that actually say, ouch, you just hit me with your scepter. But um, a, a good actor in antiquity or on a modern stage playing Oedipus is certainly going to introduce a level of physical threat, I think, in both those really very vicious arguments. After all, Jocasta feels the need to come out and separate Oedipus and, and Creon from um, uh, their fight. The really, really important violence is the threatened torture of the poor old Theban shepherd. And this is the moment when the Corinthian has already said that he's, um, he, he took the baby out to the mountain. And we finally get the local Theban slave shepherd, who's to my mind, one of the most interesting people in Greek character, in, in Greek tragedy, because besides Tiresias, he's the only person who knows everything. He knows that Oedipus was the baby that Jocasta wanted to have exposed. And that's why he's been out on the mountains all those times. And he still doesn't want to divulge the actual identity. He knows how explosive this information will be. And Oedipus actually says to some of his guards, tie his arms behind his back, and he's going to put the torture on him that was perfectly legitimate to put on slaves to extract information, even in democratic Athenian courts. It's a terrible moment where this very old man is about to be tortured on stage and is physically confined by Oedipus. And then at the end of the play, again, this is very much a directorial decision, but we know that uh, Oedipus's little girls, his meaning and Antigone are torn away from him by Creon. Um, terribly moving moment. He's lost his eyesight. He's lost his wife. Um, he's utterly disgraced. He's losing his throne and his daughters are taken away. Reported, of course, we have the death of Laius, which is remembered by Oedipus and Jocasta in conversation in that really creepy debate, not debate, dialogue, really creepy dialogue, where he asks things like, uh, what did he look like? And Jocasta says, well, rather like you actually, darling, but with grayer hair. 
you know, it, 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 it's, uh, but we hear about the incident at the crossroads, the terrible episode of road rage where Oedipus lashed out at Laius and a ill-determined number of other people who were killed. So there was this explosion of temper up at the triple crossroads, which lies in the background. Then, of course, the messenger speech is one of the most moving in all Greek tragedy, the dreadful suicide of Jocasta, Oedipus smashing through the door, smashing through to get into her bedroom, then taking the brooches from her gown and, and blinding himself. I mean, I, I don't need to give you any more detail. You, you know how powerful that is. And then, although it's not violent in itself, when he comes out with his mask covered, um, his eyes covered in blood and, and, and the chorus's visceral reaction, because that, you know, he is polluted, they could catch it, is a scene which, if not actually violent, is the record of violence and involves a great amount of physicality. So I've given you a few pictures of those scenes. This vase is one which, has been claimed to be the uh, Corinthian messenger in Oedipus with, and it's on the syllabus, um, it's in Syracuse in Sicily, that is supposed to be Jocasta listening with horror and going off to commit suicide. This is supposed to be the little girls from the end. It's supposed to be Oedipus listening to the Corinthian messenger. I, however, rather notoriously have written a blog, which you can find on the, if you just, Google on editorial and then um, Oedipus, you will find it. I don't think it is uh, uh, from the Oedipus for various reasons. In particular, those are actually boys, not girls. Scholars have been deceived by the long ringlets, but if you actually look, their father's got long ringlets. And here's a production where Oedipus is about to um, torture the poor old Theban slave, who knows, everything. And happy families, some of the other violent moments. Here is um, Oedipus coming out with, he's not got a mask on, that was a realist production, the incredible effect though of his blinded eyes. Here is um, a film version where his children, his little girls are about to be torn from him by Creon's henchmen. And this is a scene which doesn't happen, but which some people, when they're producing it today, and I'd be interested in people's responses, he does have the corpse of Jocasta brought out in some productions. That is not in the script. If Sophocles had wanted her corpse out there, he'd have had it. So I'd be quite interested to hear from people whether they think that that is actually going to add to the emotive effect of the reported violence in the Oedipus. To link through to Bacchae, I thought it was a good thing to give you the um, Royal House of Thebes uh, family tree, because although Bacchae is performed almost certainly a lot later than Oedipus, because Sophocles is well dead by 405, as is Euripides, the, um, it's set much further back in time. So, in this generation, there's Oedipus, who is married to Jocasta, as indeed his father, Laius, had been married to Jocasta. And there are those four children, Antigone, Ismene, Eteocles, and Polynices. Jocasta's brother is, of course, Creon, who is an important character in Oedipus, and in Antigone. His father, though, although he was one of the original sown men born of the, the uh, he's descended from the sown men born of the dragon teeth, is not a particularly important aristocrat. Um, Creon manages to get the throne from a position that is not a hereditary member of the royal family. But they're very closely related, as you can see, um, in that. Um, um, Sorry, they're not so very closely related, but Oedipus is very closely related to Pentheus. Because Oedipus's father is Laius. Laius' father was Labdicus. Labdicus's father was Polydorus. 
Polydorus's father was Cadmus and Harmonia. And of course, Cadmus is in the Bacchae as the very elderly retired king of Thebes, who is um, rather keen on the Dionysiac cult. He had four children, Autonoe and Eno, um, and Semele and Agarwe, the three sisters. We only meet Agarwe, but we hear in the second messenger speech that Autonoe and Semele help, no, not, sorry, Autonoe and Eno helped Agarwe tear Penthes up. Semele's already been killed by uh, Zeus's thunderbolt. She's the mother of Dionysus. So Dionysus and Pentheus are first cousins. Um, I've been trying to work out this morning what we're going to call the relationship between Pentheus and Oedipus, but it's something like great nephew, I think. Depending on whether we, yeah, great nephew or great great nephew. Anyway, they're, not, they're two or three generations apart. So we have to imagine that the Theban royal palace that we're outside in Oedipus, is the same royal palace that we were outside in the Baki, but three or four generations later, 150 years later. So what's the violence in the Baki? Well, there is a wonderful picture of poor old Semele, pregnant Semele getting blasted by Zeus, who's then going to take the baby and sew it up in his thigh. But on stage, we do have some really very physical, at least, incidences. We have the arrest of Dionysus in his disguise as the Lydian stranger. He is arrested on stage, he's brought on, and he is clad in, in, clapped in, in fetters, and he's taken off to prison behind the palace or beneath the palace. We then have the dramatic earthquake scene when all the minads fall to the ground and Dionysus reappears. So that is actual whole stage on stage scenery violence. We don't know how that was affected in the uh, theatre exactly. Then of course we have the great moment that everybody remembers, which is the arrival of Agarwe from Kithiron with the head of Pentheus, which she thinks is the head of a lion that she's hunted. And then finally Cadmus brings on all these different pieces of Pentheus's corpse uh, which had been cut up in the, torn up in the, in the sparag moss is the word for the tearing apart of his body. Reported a very great deal. We've got in the first opening speech, Dionysus talking about how Semele was struck by the thunderbolt and the chorus go back to that. We've got two extraordinary descriptions of violence out on the mountain, out on Githyron. The first messenger speech is how all the women of Thebes, um, new mothers, old ladies, were out on the mountains doing unspeakable things with, with animals and uh, reveling and thumping the ground with their thursoi and shaking their heads backward in the traditional. So violent dances, which are probably replicated on stage by the other bunch of Minads, who are of course the barbarian Minads from Lydia. So, I think quite often what you probably had was the chorus on stage mimetically representing the kind of violent activity that was being described out on the mountain. The second messenger speech is the absolute highlight of the play. It's where Pentheus, we're told, you know, is put on the pine tree and it's bent down to the ground and then he's uh, uh, flipped off it and the long and gory description of how his head is torn off and how the other two sisters, uh, Eno and uh, Autonoe, help Agarwe and bloody gobbets lying all around and how difficult they were to find. A wonderful piece of Greek poetry, however horrific. And I think, as I said, on stage, we've got to think in terms of the chorus, choral dancing, often without actually anybody being killed, reproducing in, in, to dance effect, the kind of violent movements and jerky movements um, and, and thirsts thumping that we hear about off stage. And Greek art is very full of pictures, highly suggestive of that. This is a picture of, of female Bacchants 
um, playing the owl loss or doing their crazed movements in, in the cult of Dionysus, who's there, uh, probably represented as some kind of statue. We've got an amazing vase I only discovered this week, which the descriptions which we have both in the one of the early choral odes and of course in Dionysus from the machine telling Cadmus that he and Harmonia have got to go and take the cult of Dionysus to all the Eastern barbarians. This is a big theme. This is a marvelous vase showing Dionysus in the East astride a camel. Um, and wonderful variety of different dance postures amongst the Maenads. Again, highly suggestive of the sort of things that you'd have been seeing on stage from the barbarian Maenads. When people have, uh, I can't find an ancient picture anywhere of the pine tree incident where it's curved down with that amazing simile of the wheelwright curling round the wood like a like a like a wheelwright carpentry there are however that is a real pine forest on Mount Cathiron so when you're imagining the scenes that are going on in the second first and second messenger speech that is exactly what the uh, ancient Greeks who walked over those mountains will have imagined and when uh, renaissance and early modern painters painted it they always made sure that the pine tree is somewhere in the background. So there you've got the pine tree there and you've got the three sisters attacking him. Here's another one, ominous phallic pine tree gone back upright with him down on the ground and Dionysus watching in glee while the sisters start to tear him apart. And the tearing apart is extraordinarily popular in ancient art, uh, actually, both on vases for women, interestingly, perhaps they related to the Bacchic Sparagmos of a tyrannical young man, um, also on wine cuts because it's a Dionysiac theme. Here's a picture of two Maenads getting hold of each arm. Here's the very famous vase which shows that his legs have already been pulled off with, I assume, Argawe here and then one of her sisters here. And this little fragment I'm very fond of, you can't see it well, but because it actually says Pentheus there, it actually is written helpfully. And he's lost even more of his torso there than he has here, you know, it's gradually being torn apart. Of course, the most horrible moment in the whole play probably is when the poor deluded Agarwe is on stage with the barbarian Maenads holding the mask, probably, they probably used the mask that Pentheus had worn, um, given even more power because we know if what we work out with three actors that Pentheus actor must have played his mother, perhaps using the fact that the voice of the same actor represented some kind of family resemblance. And she actually says to the Maenads on stage, would you like to join in my feast? Would you like a bite of my lion? Absolutely horrific moment, because in this moment we see that she's combining three of the worst possible things in Greek tragedy, which is kin murder, human sacrifice, and cannibalism. I mean, that's three of the great taboos are being violated simultaneously. And the reactions of the chorus there are very alienating, that they are not at all sorry for her. They are thoroughly gleeful at her humiliation. And here's Cadmus, and she's still not come out of her deluded uh, state there. She, the chorus are gleeful. She still thinks it's a lion. Cadmus is about to bring her around from her trance. This is from a famous film version uh, where the mind that's actually to go back to the messenger scene in films, the messenger scenes are often actually enacted visually, which of course didn't happen in the ancient theatre. So finally, let me look at the time. What are we on? I've got about 14 or 15 minutes to talk about the frogs, which because it's comedy has got far more onstage violence than either of the tragedies. 
we've got Dionysus uh, stepping in, 405. The Frogs is done at the Linaya. So that's in sort of January, February. Then Dionysus comes back for the Dionysia and the, the, the uh, uh, Bacchae a couple of months later. Um, this vase in the British Museum is commonly thought to be Xanthias from the Frogs because it does actually have Xanthian written, Xanthias written on it in an Italian script. It's a, a vase made in Italy. Very interesting because it shows that Greek comedies with slaves called Xanthias, he's in a comic costume, uh, are probably being put on um, actually in South Italy. Interestingly though, South Italian, he hasn't got an Ithyphallus and that does seem to have been a difference in South Italian comedy. If it was an attic vase, he would certainly alongside the padded belly and the ugly mask have had an Ithyphallus. But he is looking at a little statue of Heracles, which kind of makes it possible that it's meant to commemorate the frogs, where of course the first scene is Dionysus and Xanthias on the donkey with the bags going to knock at the door of um, Heracles to borrow Heracles's costume. And there Dionysus has already apparently got the lion skin in the club um, in the opening scene. And although there's no actual violence, there's an awful lot of physical comedy in that opening scene with Xanthias complaining about the burden that he's carrying. There's a, there's a lot of and a lot of violent door knocking, you know, there's, a, there's physical comedy, even if it's not directly explicitly violent. So what's the violence on stage in, 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 in the frogs? Well, there's actually quite a lot, but it's almost all in the first half before the debate between Aeschylus and Euripides. The corpse scene may have been gruesome, we don't know, but you know, I can't leave out a talking corpse um, from a talk on violence in, in Greek theatre. The whole emphasis sequence is difficult. It's quite fun to act out in class because there's clearly a lot of pantomime look behind you stuff going on. There is a actor, mute actor playing a monstrous female, almost certainly actually on stage, this horrible feet she monster with a wooden leg and, and, and a terrifying face. But there's a lot of stuff between Dionysus and Xanthias about look behind you, now she's about to get you, all the rest of it. It's quite fun to work that out as to exactly how Aristophanes wanted that scene to work. There's sustained violence and threats in the whole sequence between Aeacus and landladies over which of them is Heracles, right? One of them, they keep swapping the Heracles costume. And there's a lot of discussion of the violence when Heracles came before and the violence that they would all like to inflict on Heracles because he stole Cerberus and ate all their food. And of course, the famous and hilarious and also shocking because it shows us what happened to slaves, flogging scene where uh, there's a competition, actual blows both Dionysus and Xanthias being flogged and lots of screams um, going on to test which of them is the actual God. But there's a great deal of violence reported as well. Um, the battle, the sea battle of Argonusa is quite a dominant theme. This is the battle that had happened a year before where um, many, many people had died and their bodies had not been properly picked up and that had led to the trial of the generals who had been executed for not picking up the body. So there's this appalling actual real life violence in the whole of the opening episode. There's a lot of violence discussed in, in the Heracles uh, dialogue. He, his advice for committing suicide, he explains all the different ways you can get down to the underworld, like jumping off towers or hanging yourself. Um, he says when he's describing down there, well, everybody's down there, people who hit their father or mother or smash their father in the jaw, discussions of violence. The landlady's memories of Heracles, which we'll look at in a moment. And in the second half, although there isn't any direct physical violence, I don't think between Aeschylus and Euripides, we get 
quite a lot of discussion of how warlike Aeschylus's plays were and how they made the Athenians want to be out on the battlefield and, and, and in a military frame of mind. So the, the, the war theme does not disappear. The corpse scene, I'm very pleased. I've just recently discovered these amazing woodcuts in a very rare 1937 edition of The Frogs. I've put the link up to all of them. And there's a lot more on the ACE Facebook group yesterday. And I also tweeted it out. So I don't know how much general physical ho horseplay went on with the corpse and his bags, uh, Dionysus and Xanthias, but uh, it certainly brings death very firmly onto the agenda. The interesting thing about the whole Eacus scene, uh, I think this is one of the most violent speeches in all of ancient Greek literature, um, even though it's um, descriptive and reported and threats. Okay, so this is Aeacus who is remembering when he sees Dionysus dressed up as Heracles. He's remembering what happened to Heracles and then saying what he's going to do to punish him. Oh, you disgusting, shameless, brazen one, foul and befouled and completely foul. You're the one who drove out our dog Cerberus. You stuck a gag on him, grabbed him and ran away when I was guarding him. But now I've got you. This is how the black hearted Stygian rock. This is all a sort of tragic parody of tragic diction. This is how the black hearted Stygian rock of Acheron's gore dripping crag will guard you. The dogs of Cocytus who charge around, the, the hundred headed echidna who will rip up your innards, the Tartesian eel who will assault your lungs, your kidneys will bleed with your entrails, the Tithrasian gorgons will tear you apart. Towards them I will move my sprinting foot. To which Xanthias says, Ooh, Dionysus, what have you gone? And Dionysus says, Shat myself, call to God. So, we have this description of all the horrible, violent things that could happen to you in the underworld. Then Dionysus gives us this strange song when it's discussed uh, uh, the, the, the role swapping, uh, giving out the costume to Xanthia. But it's a, a, an extraordinary insight into what happens at symposia between masters and slaves. So it is real violence being described, but it's just a sort of hypothetical sequence. And he says, wouldn't it be hilarious if Xanthias, who is a slave, was upside down on Milesian bed covers, kissing a dancing girl and then demanded the chamber pot. And I, now a slave, had to look at him, grabbed him by his chickpea. And he, because he's a villain himself, saw me punch me on the jaw with his fist and knocked out my front row of teeth. Well. If that's the sort of thing that happened, did slaves going, uh, did masters actually demand chamber pots from their slaves at the symposia? Did masters then grab their slaves by the penis? Did the slaves then retaliate by punching their masters on the jaw and knocking out their teeth? Well, that's a pretty violent sequence to imagine. And the landlady and Plathony, they're both landladies, Remembering when Heracles first came, Landlady says, when I was sorting out the finances, he stared at me fiercely and bellowed. And Xanthias says, that's just what he does. That's how he is everywhere. Because Xanthias is trying to work them up against Dionysus in Heracles' costume. He unsheathed his sword with a crazy look. Oh, by Zeus, he did, you poor woman. We were both petrified and charged upstairs straight away. But he dashed out after seizing our sleeping mats, Xanthias. That's exactly what he does. So we get this memory of Heracles being violent in Hades. And then the landlady decides that this is actually is Heracles says, how I hate your throat. I'm going to knock out your molars with which you ate all my merchandise. Yes, and I'll throw you into the pit. That's the Barathron where criminals were executed in Athens. Um, I'll get a sickle and cut out the larynx you suck my tripe down with. And I love this picture of the, the landladies attacking Heracles. So not Heracles, sorry, Dionysus in Heracles disguise, egged on, of course, by Xanthias. So we have this women on, on men violence. And then we have 
of course, the preliminary, this is the opening up to the, the whipping scene. I haven't given you the actual flogging scene. Ircus, quick, tie up uh, the dog. Um, you know, hurry up, do it. He says it to um, his Scythian slaves. Aristophanes imagines that just as in Athens, there was this sort of police force of Scythian slaves, or I prefer to see them as like nightclub heavies under the instructions of the magistrate. Ooh, someone's in trouble because the roles have reversed. Xanthia, get lost, don't you come near me, he says to the Scythian slaves. Ircus, ooh, ooh, so you can fight. Ditilas Skeblias Pardakos. That's typically Scythian comic names, barbarian name. Come and fight him. So we've got three Scythians against Xanthias. Oh, isn't it terrible this man hits other people and steals their property as well? Dionysus now egging on the violence against Xanthias. Just appalling, says Ericus. Evil and terrible, says Dionysus. And Xanthias says, by his use. If I ever come here before, I'm willing to die. If I ever stole anything worth a hair, I'm going to do something very noble for you. Arrest this boy here, pointing to Dionysus, the slave costume now, and torture him. If you catch me doing anything wrong, take me to my death, because he's much braver than Dionysus. Oh, and how shall I torture him, says he, because... And Xanthias really gets into it and says, any way you like, time to a ladder, hang him, flog him, with a whip, skin him, put screws on him, pour vinegar in his nostrils, pour bricks on him, do everything except stroke him gently with a tender leek or baby onion. You know, anything but the soft pillow, as Monty Python would have put it. And then we get the actual flogging scene. So actually, the entire sequence actually in Hades, until the uh, emergence of Aeschylus and Euripides, is extraordinarily non-stop violent and a lot of it is actually Dionysus and Xanthias egging on the people who live in Hades to be violent to them so it's master slave violence being enacted through complex meta theater complex role exchange between Dionysus as the slave and Xanthias Dionysus as the master Xanthias as the slave role reversing that through swapping the Heracles costume, which of course, with the lion skin and the club, is inherently symbolic of violence anyway. Um, there's Xanthias getting really stroppy with the Scythian slaves in Heracles costume in these woodcuts. Isn't that wonderful? Good old Xanthias. And there's the flogging scene about to start. There's Ircus saying, ooh, oh, are you the god? Are you the god? Are you the god? Are you the god? Here's my stick. And then just to conclude, as I said, although there, I don't think there is much physical violence in the argument between the two tragic poets, the, the, the debate scene between them, uh, we do have this great piece of physical theatre with the enormous scales that are brought on. And I love the way the woodcutter, John Austin, he was called, has, has depicted this because he's got Euripides' scale pan is actually pretty much completely empty. There's just one little person in it because he's been talking about having witty, clever, philosophical people in his, his dramas, but it's rather empty. Whereas Aeschylus has gone on about his Persians and his Seven Against Thebes and how he made the Athenians want to go to war. So he's got his scale pan full of the accoutrements of, of grand epic warfare and his scale pan going down with the sheer weight of that. I think that's a brilliant realization. So in conclusion, you've got very different kinds of violence. Obviously in comedy, you have far, far more onstage violence. Um, the Bacchae is unusual because it's got two long messenger speeches with extraordinary amount of very gruesome violence going on. The Oedipus, it's kind of more psychological. And although no violence is actually committed, we're about to get the torture of the old Theban shepherd. And we certainly get the pulling away of the children. So although 
the violence that Oedipus has committed in the past with Laius is, is, is really very terrible and we hear about it. And, and, and the suicide of Jocasta and the blinding of Oedipus is, that's very different. But that gives you an idea of the range of different kinds of ways in which violence is treated in our three plays. Thank you very much.